Welcome to Under One Roof's Landlord and Letting Agent webinar series, made possible through the generous funding of the Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. The webinar will start momentarily. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free, independent service that supports landlords, letting agents, owner-occupiers, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, Scottish Government and local authorities throughout Scotland, we attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's webinar will last one hour. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. The information provided in this webinar is designated to help you understand your rights and responsibilities and to understand what professionals tell you. Any technical information on repairs is designed to help you spot problems with your building and then understand quotations from builders so you can get the best job carried out for the best price. But every building and every group of owners is unique and so are their problems which is why the information presented in this webinar can only act as a general guidance. It is not advice or a recommended course of action. When it comes to action, you should always seek professional help with anything more than a simple problem. More details and our legal disclaimer can be found in the About Us section of our website. Finally, if you are a housing professional wishing to record your attendance as CPD, please visit the webinar page on our website so you can log your participation and receive a confirmation certificate. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to our uh, latest in our uh, Landlord and Letting Agent uh, webinar series. I'm Mike Kefron, the Chief Executive of Under One Roof. And uh, today we're going to be talking about using traditional building methods. So over the next hour or so, we're going to have a uh, combination of a video uh, that will of a conversation I had with Fiona Sinclair, uh, who is an uh, architect, is a hist an historian, author, and an accredited in conservation architecture at an advanced level. Uh, Fiona has worked on the uh, care and repair of a uh, diverse range of historic buildings, including ancient monuments, churches, and country houses, which require an expert knowledge of traditional building methods and materials. So over the next 20 minutes or so, uh, I'll, um, we'll be showing that video that I pre-recorded with Fiona. And then Fiona's going to join us later along with John McKinney. John is, uh, he provides a wealth of information in traditional building methods uh, as the current secretary of the National Federation of Roofing Contractors and a number of other roles uh, within Scotland's construction sector. Um, so Fiona and John um, will be joining us after the video, um, along with uh, Chris Karras, who's, uh, Chris is a co-founder of Loco Home Retrofit CIC, which is a uh, organization based out of Glasgow. It's a new retrofit cooperative for ho uh, homeowners, tradespeople, and building professionals. Uh, and whose members are working together to widen access to eco home improvements and low carbon heating. And we thought we would bring uh, Chris in as well to the conversation just to talk very briefly about the organization and what he's up to, what they've got coming up, but also sort of how uh, traditional building methods uh, fit in with uh, eco retrofit work as well. So we will have that, uh, that at that period, that point in about half an hour or so uh, will be an opportunity for you to submit um to get your questions answered. So we'd ask you to submit those now uh, in the chat box. There is a, you'll see that there is a Q and A section that we'd ask you to pop your quick, your questions in for, um, and we'll give, uh, that'll give our, our uh, guests a chance to take a look at them and um, mull them over over the next 20 minutes or so while we watch the video. And then uh, over the course of the, the rest of the, the webinar, please uh, pop your questions in. Um, and uh, we'll get you uh, best as we can some information to hopefully help you out. So, um, so before we get to the Q and A, though, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to an, the interview that I recorded with Fiona, and we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes.
Fiona, thanks for joining us today. Um, maybe if you could first talk about which areas of a tenement flat might an owner need to use trad traditional building methods on. Um, well, I guess a great deal depends on what alterations have already been carried out to the tenement. Um, because as you know, during the 1980s, uh, there, was, there was a great deal of what we call uh, common repairs projects, uh, where public funding uh, was given to uh, typically owner occupiers with which to carry out mostly structural work. It was awarded to tenements that were in a state of disrepair and it was to assist owners. Um, and as part and parcel of that, frequently um, tenements were re-roofed and perhaps chimneys uh, were, were taken down. Um, and in that sort of case, an owner might find they've got um, non-traditional materials uh, on their roof and, and their, their chimneys are missing and potentially their windows have already been replaced. But if an owner's really lucky and they're in an original tenement that um, hasn't had a great deal of uh, improvement work carried out to it, but it's been really carefully repaired over the years, then you will probably find it has a, a slate roof, um, which is a traditional uh, building material. Um, depending on where the tenement is in the country, um, it could be a slate from the uh, the West Highland, one of the West Highland uh, quarries. Um, tenements closer to the border typically had slates from either Cumbria or possibly uh, a Welsh slate. Um, Edwardian tenements uh, tended to use uh, either Cumbrian or Welsh slates because it provided a nice colour contrast with the red sandstone that was being used. Um, a tenement owner will almost invariably find that their front wall, um, maybe even the back wall, and sometimes the gable um, is constructed of sandstone. That sandstone might be red sandstone, it might be buff sandstone. Uh, sometimes a rear wall or a gable is built of brick. You'll find that a traditional tenement that hasn't been improved uh, but has been kept in a good state of repair will have timber sliding sash and case windows. An owner might have lovely timber floorboards, they might have uh, plaster cornice work, it might be decorative or it might be quite simple, it might be a sort of very simple coving. Uh, Edwardian tenements tend to have um, sort of slightly simplified details because that was what was very popular at the time, there was a kind of lean towards um, the sort of modernism of the Edwardian period. Um, a lucky owner might have lovely panel doors, um, and a uh, very lucky owner might live uh, and share a, a common close with their neighbours, which has lovely close wall tiling, uh, maybe a nice timber um, balustrade, nice timber handrail, and if they're very, very lucky, perhaps some leaded glass or stained glass in a, in a staircase window. Uh, corner tenements were frequently lit from uh, the roof, so there might be a nice cupola as well. That's the sort of, um, that's the sort of traditional building materials that, um, a tenement owner might find. Um, they, they'll almost certainly find that they've got one or, or more of those. Um, there might be some aspects of the tenement that have been altered, but for the most part, you would expect to find those. Um, and a, a really, really lucky owner will find they've got the original brass iron mongery as well. But that's that's the sort of thing that's, um, doors and, and windows are much more likely to have been replaced at some point in their, in their lifetime. Uh, so that, that's the sort of thing that an owner um, might, might find. Uh, certainly an owner living in a, an older tenement, um, perhaps a late Georgian, early Victorian tenement, will find it's perhaps a little plainer. There won't be close wall tiling. Um, the, the, the walls will be finished in cement render in the close and they'll just be painted up to dado height. And that, that doesn't mean the tenement is, is any less um, you know, attractive and desirable. It's just, a, it's just a reflection of the building materials that were being used at the time. And uh, can you talk, is it quite a bit different for builders to be working on older traditional tenement buildings and those features rather than newer stuff? Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what has to be remembered about tenements is everything's bigger. It's much, mm -hmm. much bigger. So uh, floor to ceiling heights are much higher um, which typically uses more in the way of materials when it comes to, to repairs. Uh, floor joists, the, 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 the tenement floor joists are much, much bigger. Um, they're, they're, they're deeper and they're also wider than the sort of floor joists that house builders typically use nowadays. Um, external walls are not built with cavities, not what, what 
you know, people would imagine to be a cavity. There are cavities in uh, tenement uh, outer walls, but they're not where you would expect them. They, they kind of occur between the finished plaster on lath lining and the, the back of the, the, the inner face of the outside wall. Um, what is important about tenements, it's worth remembering, is they were built in a very kind of breathable way. So the outer wall of a tenement, uh, you know, sandstone is breathable, the line pointing that was used, it's, it's all kind of designed to be breathable. Um, and, and, and that essentially meant that cavity walls weren't introduced until you know, the beginning of the, the 20th century because there was this awareness that they were inherently breathable. The bricks that you find that um, are used to build internal walls and tenements are much, much bigger than modern bricks. And these are the sorts of things that people have to be aware of, that it's very, very difficult to actually carry out a repair using modern materials because they're typically much smaller um, and, and they're, they're, they're built in a different way. Um, you might find that a tenement owner might find there's still a little bit of lead left in their, in their flat, not in the water pipe work, but possibly in the waste pipe work because that was the go-to material for bath waste and sink waste um, and basin waste. And there might still be, you know, some traces of that. So an owner needs to look out for that because lead used in a, a bath waste or basin waste, it just it does wear out in time. That's the sort of thing to to potentially be aware of. But I think um, what what the difference is, everything is larger, um, mm. and uh, it, it's by implication it's heavier. Interestingly. Um, there's this kind of misconception there's not an awful lot of timber in tenements, but actually there's a huge amount of timber in tenements. Um, and that timber has to be kept dry. So, of course, if the timber uh, gets wet, then you've got potential for an outbreak of wet rot or, or dry rot um, because of this, this lack of the, um, of the of cavity wall construction because the, the sort of timber floor joists are built into the outer walls and they essentially hold the tenement together. They stop the back and front walls from kind of parting company with one another. Um, so uh, that's the sort of thing to kind of look out for that typically um, people living in modern houses don't have to look out for because they're almost always built with, with cavity walls. And of course, in very, very old tenements, there's always the possibility of a bit of woodworm just because of the age of the tenement and the sort of timbers that were being used. Um, but, you know, and the, the, these really are the, the sorts of things to, to look out for. But I think the key is everything's bigger, it's heavier, it's thicker. Um, and that's the essential difference between, a, you know, a kind of a modern tenement, if you like, and an older tenement. And you frequently see around cities a five story modern tenement sitting alongside a four story traditional tenement. Um, and, and they're the same height. And that, that, that really kind of sums it up that, that you can kind of um, you can achieve the height of an old tenement um, by by dint of having far lower floor to ceiling heights that comply with modern legislation. Um, but the wonderful thing about old tenements and their lovely large, large windows and their, their large floor to ceiling heights is they're fantastically airy. There's a lot of kind of air, there's a lot of ventilation and that's what's really great about them. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about building methods too. I mean, are there, in traditional buildings, are there certain elements that really you need to use modern building material for, or is there, um, and at the same time, are there any downfalls, or what are the downfalls to not using traditional building uh, methods when you have the opportunity to do so? Um, well, I think, um, yeah, I, I think the, a number of, of uh, owners living in tenements might find that by dint of the age of the building, it's actually a listed building. It's, it's protected by some form of statutory uh, legislation. I think a large number of owners of tenants will find they're in a conservation area. And that in itself brings a requirement to uh, use traditional building materials, mm -hmm. at least on the outside. Um, yeah. So for instance, um, UPVC windows, uh, per permission has to essentially be uh, applied for to replace windows to, to buildings in a conservation area and, and uh, buildings that are listed, that are protected. Um, and, you know, a colleague and I were, were, were talking last year about how 
the, the, the kind of increase in the use of UPVC windows, it's death by a thousand cuts to, to tenements mm -hmm. because planning departments simply don't have the resources to kind of stay on top of the numbers that are being fitted by people who probably aren't aware that they need permission to do it. Um, I think it's interesting, um, you know, satellite dishes and UPVC windows are, are probably the, the, the two things that m sort of change the appearance of a building most dramatically. Mm -hmm. I think that what people living in a tenement probably um, you know, need to understand is there's an inherent value in the aesthetic of a tenement. They were designed to be very, very uniform um, and to kind of contribute to the streetscape. And there's nothing lovelier than a tenement that has all of its windows in the correct material, the correct subdivision and the correct colour. And it just adds that little bit of value to the building. And I think people would be surprised by that. Um, it's quite disconcerting to see uh, a very, very sort of uniform street of tenements with a kind of like assortment of windows. And I, it yep. kind of devalues the streetscape and, it, and it, to a degree it devalues the building as well. Um, I think that the thing about UPVC is it's not recyclable and it can't be repaired, whereas a timber sash and case window can be repaired by a skilled joiner. Um, it, to a degree, uh, you, 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 you know, double glazing is something that the planning departments have accepted is, um, is to be encouraged if it's possible to actually replace uh, failed timber windows with new timber windows that have double glazing. It's a little bit more difficult in Georgian tenements because the timbers are so slender. It's much, much easier in Edwardian tenements because the builders typically use far chunkier sections. So there's an understanding that that's the sort of thing that, that, that you, you can't prevent people from doing that because it's really all about reducing uh, heat loss and improving comfort levels. But you don't need to go down the, the, the kind of uh, UPVC route to achieve that. Um, and the beauty of a timber window is that you can extend its life by repairing it. Um, you can change its color. Um, there's a, a you, you get more light too, don't you? Um, I think I think the, the difficulty with UPVC windows, I'm not sure if it's the case now, but when they grew in popularity, what tended to happen was that they were fitted within the, the old timber frames. So the old sashes were taken out, but the old timber frame, the case was left in place and um, the UPVC window was installed within that. So you've, you've still got potential for deterioration in, in the component. Um, and it's just very, very difficult to kind of like adjust them and fit them. I mean, old uh, sash and case windows are fitted with something called a fox wedge, which is a wedge that kind of comes to, to a point a bit like a foxy snout. And it allows the kind of window to be beautifully adjusted. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's just one example of something where, you know, the value of a property is enhanced by going down the traditional route. Um, I think that you know, roofing materials, slate versus concrete roofing tile. Well, the, the, the thing about modern building materials is they typically get shorter lifespans. They've got good lifespans, but they're typically shorter. So a sheet of lead on a roof, for instance, um, if it's the correct weight and it's the correct size and it's been installed by someone uh, who's, who's installed it correctly, then that's going to last about 100 years. And you'll not get that life out of any of the kind of modern products that are being used. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of lead is it can be repaired. Uh, roofing slate, is, it's a remarkably flexible material. You can't do a turret, you can't do a dome, you can't go around a corner all that easily with a concrete roofing tile because the, the kind of unit size is too big and too thick. Um, so roofing slates are, are more flexible than someone might imagine out of something that's very, very rigid. They too have an incredibly long uh, lifespan, longer than a a concrete uh, roofing tile. Um, the sort of materials that have been used in the past to repair stonework were typically not breathable. Um, there are there are materials on the market now that are are you know much more appropriate to use. So I think it's a case of the the original building materials. Tenement builders knew what they were doing, um, and they they were thinking. It's certainly the kind of Victorian periods architects were all thinking about how to make tenement buildings brighter and lighter and, uh, you know, kind of better ventilated and better served by, you know, water and waste. And they were always thinking through um, and, and 
you know, that's, that's something that is worth maintaining. Um, and they were built, they were, they were built for the long term. They were built to last. So they can, their lifespan can be hugely um, prolonged, increased by, by doing, uh, reusing those materials, the original ones. Does using traditional building materials often cost a little bit more in the short term, but the the payoff is that they last longer, or is that even a misconception that they even cost more on the on the front end when installing? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I would say over the last two years the cost of all building materials has risen. So perhaps five years ago I would have agreed with you that the use of traditional building materials did come at a cost. Uh, but interestingly, we've seen all manner of building materials increase in price. So even a humble sheet of plasterboard is now um, more expensive than it once was. Steel has gone up in price, so has timber. Um, so it's almost as if modern building materials have caught up. Um, and the, the, But what I would say about traditional building materials is quite often there's a longer waiting time. Mm. So quarrying of stone, um, there, there's a long lead in time if you're, if you're looking for some replacement stone. Um, if, for instance, you're looking for um, some salvage, some secondhand slate uh, that might be potentially used to, re to repair um, a roof, then you might struggle. You might have to wait until somebody else strips a roof or a church is demolished or um, a warehouse is, is demolished. Um, there's, a, there's usually a bit of kind of hunting around uh, for salvaged building materials, which is always a good source, but they, it's becoming harder and harder to find those. So I would say that um, it, there's, there's quite often a kind of time implication. And I guess people would say that with time comes money, the longer you wait for something, then, you know, uh, potentially the more expensive it becomes. But I, I, I wouldn't say... Um, you know, materials such as lead, they, they, they've always been expensive and they will, they will you know, remain expensive, um, you know, because lead is, is a commodity. But once you've, you know, applied a, a sheet of lead, you don't have to go back to it if it's done properly. So, yes, you might be paying a little bit more for it, but in the, in the time that you might have replaced the flashings on a, a roof five times in felt, um, you know, when you add it up, that that investment in in that lead is is worth it. Um, and when and when an owner's looking to find a contractor, what what are the kind of things that they should be looking for? And is it the contractor that's responsible for sourcing that material uh, that you just mentioned? Yeah, it usually is. Um, it, it's a tricky one actually because. The best thing that an owner can probably do is, is, is kind of like ask around if somebody else has done something similar. Um, there are a number of building preservation trusts and city heritage trusts in Scotland. Um, and it's always worth going onto their websites to look at previous projects because quite often that lists the contractor that carried out the work. Um, there's almost always scaffoldings up around the cities and um, it, it's, it's worth kind of having a look at who's carrying out that work. And then a, there's no substitute for speaking to someone who's used a contractor and gives them a good reference. Um, but typically what you will find is most contractors will have subcontractors. So they'll have, um, they'll have they might be um, a really good roofing subcontractor, a really uh, good roofing contractor, but they will subcontract the stonework because that's not a skill they've got in-house. Um, and they will typically subcontract it to someone they've got a good relationship with and they trust and they know they'll get um, a good price from, but also get a, a, a good service from. Uh, so you're really looking for a contractor who's got quite a few contacts of their own. And a good, a good contractor will also know where to source those materials um, because they'll have had that sort of experience. It's a tricky one because um, all of the, the kind of grant providers in Scotland, they're not really allowed to, um, to, to make recommendations. They're not allowed to recommend a contractor. Um, but it's, it's, always, it's always a good shout to, um, to speak to someone who's been through the same sort of process. Um, you will probably find a lot of tenements are factored as well. Um, and the factor will have a, a list of, of contractors um, that they, they, they typically use to carry out repairs. Great. Fiona, that was wonderful information. Very helpful. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you.
And welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation and found it as enlightening as I did when I conducted it uh, a little while ago. And uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, have an opportunity for you to ask some questions uh, of uh, both Fiona and um, of uh, John and Chris. So we'll bring John and uh, Chris in here. I think Fiona as well, though she might be having some tech issues. So we'll bring her in as quickly as we can. Um, hi, John, how are you? Hi, Chris. I'm fine. Hello. Thanks. Um, just to, for anyone who joined us a little bit late, John is uh, a uh, building. Ooh, hold on, I'm having some tech problems myself here. Hold on one second. Uh, let's see if I can get that up. the screen I need. There we go, John. Um, he's Secretary of National Federation of Roofing Contractors and does a number of, of roles within the Scotland's Construction Center uh, uh, sector. And Chris is the co-founder of Local Homes Retrofit. It's a new retrofit cooperative for homeowners, tradespeople, and building professionals located uh, working specifically in the south side of Glasgow. Uh, and we'll bring Fiona here in, in a minute. But, um, John, first of all, I thought I would just turn to you just to get some thoughts on uh, what Fiona said there. Was there anything that sort of struck you about the conversation that you just heard? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yes, a uh, hundred things. Uh, Fiona's <laughs> fantastic. I love listening to Fiona, so it's absolutely great to uh, hear Fiona once again, a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I, I think Fiona's point about uh, the breathable sandstone and mortars, and um, you've got to be aware of the rule of unintended consequences here in respect of putting modern um, modern pr products on your, your building. It reminds me of when I was actually a kid, I had a, a snail as a pet, had a pet snail, and I removed its shell to see if it would make it go faster. It just made it more sluggish. <laughs> <laughs> Unintended consequences, sorry. Um, but the, the point is you put uh, cement on, and it's a cement mortar I see a lot, where it's actually, that then stops the breathability. So it stops the water being able to get out. The lime mortar is, uh, is sacrificial. So it helps the, the, the water come away from the building and ca cascade down the external facade. Uh, but if you put in the wrong mortar in, it actually then captures the, that water and doesn't let it come out. So then it actually erodes the stone. So you get, you get uh, erosion of the stone. And then obviously a, lot, a far larger disrepair happens in the future. So you've got to make sure the materials match with previous materials. And it's also the same with the stone. Um, you also get cementitious repairs of, of stone where they've actually put a front on the stone of cement and then again that traps the water and then ultimately the the cement repair fails relatively quickly and then you know you've got uh, big bits of cement falling off buildings unfortunately you can have uh, you can have these things failing and falling onto the ground below so it's a very very important to get the right mortar and uh, the right stone and other materials that you're replacing light for light with um, the point uh, about the sash and case windows and alternatives to double glazing, yes, energy efficiency is a huge thing. Uh, it's a huge thing anyway, but it's a huge thing on the back of COP26 that, that, that it, it's raised that profile. Um, but there's, there's, what, the first important thing about making your property energy efficient is to make it window water tight. 71% of Scotland's traditional buildings are not wind and water tight. That's according to the Scottish Housing Conditions Survey. Now, a lot of these that elements of disrepair are small, uh, so it's not there's not a huge amount of work. But if you've got a bucket with a 2% hole in it, it's not an effective bucket. Exactly the same with your roof. If you've got a small hole in that roof, it's not an effective roof. It's not watertight. You've got to get that fixed. So it's estimated within the uh, historic environment or historic scotland at the time but historic environment scotland our place in time that there's 600 million pounds spent annually on traditional buildings in scotland yet 72 71 percent are still not wind and water tight so we've got to change the way we're spending our money in our buildings and repair and maintain them for the future generations and if you're done properly with the right materials by the, the trade people who are qualified then uh, as uh, it was stated, um, Fiona said, was, you know, these repairs are done, they'll last a long time. These buildings have been up for a long time and they will last a heck of a long time. Um, so a couple of other things I'd like to, at the fourth crossings, you never thought I'd mention that when we're talking about tenements. If you look at the fourth, the, the first of fourth, and there's three bridges, as you all know, that go over the first of fourth. 
One was opened in 1890, one was opened in 1960s, and one was opened very recently at £1.36 billion. Pounds. Which one do you think will be standing in another 100 years' time that will still be used uh, if it's properly maintained? Well, I'm guessing it's going to be the, the rail crossing. So using traditional build, you know, traditional buildings are the same. Repair, maintain them, and they'll last for a lot longer. They'll last a, a very long time. Uh, they were built to last, and they will last. And um, if you are undertaking repairs in your building, one of the things, it's, it's very hard for homeowners, is if you're having, let's say, a, a, a roofing repair done to your building, then it's an ideal, op and you're having a scaffold put up because it's a tenement. That's a heck of a lot of money you're scaffold. So at that time, it's an ideal opportunity to actually look at the rest of the building and actually say, well, are there other elements of disrepair that can be done whilst that scaffold is up? Um, so that will save you the cost of the scaffold maybe in two or three years' time when something else would then fail uh, and therefore save you money in the long run. And uh, I'll just do a wee, um, a wee pitch uh, is that we'll be running the Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival this year, part of the Festival Fringe. It'll be our 10th one and we're hoping to be live again. Mike, you might remember you, you starred in, the, uh, <laughs> in, the, in last year's one for the, the tour of the Royal Mile. Um, but we're hoping this year we'll be able to do it in person again, but we'll be all online, it'll be a hybrid version, and there'll be a, an element of in-person skills demonstrations. So once the details go out, I'll obviously send them on to, to Under One Roof and Mike. Um, it might be something that people who are listening in today might be interested in either coming along and watching it live, these demonstrations or the talks, or um, actually viewing them online. But I think I think that's my... Um, did I mention the Sash and Case windows? No, Sash and Case nope. windows. Sorry. We do actually sorry. have a question about Sash and Case windows, actually. So why don't you hold off for a okay. second? Okay, that, that's we'll your way of saying I'm talking too much. Windows. It's all right. It's not um, unusual. John, and one one other thing that just sort of struck me when you were saying there, too, about sort of if you've got the scaffolding up, be taking a look at other things that are going on. I think that's something also, and to bring Chris into this conversation a little bit, that is a that's something also as far as retrofit work that we also recommend that if you're looking at doing uh retrofit work um uh, for energy efficiency in, in your building that you'd be looking at everything else that needs to be done at the same time as well because that scaffolding can get very expensive to have up so use try to do as much um of it in as in one go as you can i think is is sort of the advice and, and Chris, maybe on that note of sort of talking about retrofit, just bringing that into the conversation, maybe you could talk very briefly about what it is that, that local homes does and how this fits into traditional building using traditional. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, so local home retrofit community interest company is what, what we're calling it. We're a cooperative in Glasgow focused on retrofit. And last in December, we launched our membership program. So we're open to really anybody who wants to, um, is interested in retrofit for energy efficiency and uh, low carbon heating. Um, so that's homeowners, uh, tradespeople, buildings professionals, and really any, even if those people aren't working in retrofit now, they might be thinking about it, um, we, we sort of welcome with open arms. And the goal is to accelerate retrofit, um, in particular for the owner occupier sector and the able to pay owner occupiers that um, can't, um, you know, who are sort of pretty much on their own. They want There's many people that want to get started on energy efficiency and getting off fossil fuels, but find it hard to get started. Um, and the we're not for profit, we're for purpose, and that's, that purpose is reducing Glasgow's, or helping to reduce Glasgow's contribution to climate change. Um, and the reason for being in a cooperative is that retrofit is hard. So like we've said before, it's complex and costly to not just to, never mind, energy efficiency and decarbonization, just maintenance, uh, you know, is, is the whole whole purpose of Under One Roof is it's just it's complex and costly, especially in shared buildings to um, to make progress on on retrofit. And part of it is it's difficult to find tradespeople. And there is actually a capacity and skills um, issue, which is going to be have to be addressed if, if Scotland is to meet its net zero goals. So we want to help be a, an intermediary that's bringing the property owners together with the, the supply chain to help um, build uh, build the connection and help build the supply chain and build the market at, simultaneously and that's another way in which retrofit is difficult for the property owners is that it's really risky so it's complex it's costly but it's also risky and that goes to what john and fiona were saying about uh, traditional buildings where you know pre-1919 constructions with solid walls 
um, are they are vapor, vapor permeable. It's really important to maintain um, the ability of the walls to dry inward into the property as well as outward. Um, and that's when we're introducing insulation and air tightness, we're deliberately changing the movement of air, heat and, and moisture. And it's critically important to the health of the building and to the health of the, fabric, uh, of the occupants that we, main, we remain aware of um, that, uh, you know, of, of vapor permeability. And we find that homeowners, uh, property owners are having made changes made to their homes without fully being aware of these things. And we're hearing some, you know, frankly, hor hor horrifying stories of um, like rigid insulation being put in as internal wall insulation, um, which is totally inappropriate. It's bad for the, for the building. It will drive moisture to congregate or could lead to moisture getting into the joists and increasing the risk of rot or mold spores, which is a health risk for the occupants. So we want to help people. Um, we have a program of events to for education and awareness, not just for our members, for, for anybody. So if you find our website, logohome.coop, um, you can just watch those videos, some interesting case studies on tenements. And um, we also provide a paid um, bespoke advice service. And we're starting to use the power of um, our, our membership to build some scaled approaches to have, um, you know, have through strength in numbers, make it uh, easier to, to purchase and make it more attractive for suppliers to address this market in bigger numbers. So if, if yeah, please do look us up, if, uh, especially if you're in Glasgow, look up um, our website, localhome.coop and, and see about joining um, or, or just coming to our events. So yeah, so on traditional buildings, uh, like I said, it's, we, we when it comes to retrofit, um, the, like you said there, it's important to take a whole building approach. So the, the latest thinking in retrofit is you should think about the whole building and have a, a package of measures that interact with each other really effectively. And by the way, there's a really great uh, tool for assessing things that is quite good, you know, even for the, the aware homeowner who's not a professional can actually look at the STBA's, STBA's retrofit wheel to see how different measures can interact with each other. And you're looking to avoid negative interactions between, for example, air tightness and, uh, and moisture. Um, so we, um, yeah, whole building approach is really important. And of course, um, where we're looking at externally insulated, so we might, there are some examples, for example, Nidri Road in Glasgow, where the rear facade has been insulated externally. Um, that's a very significant undertaking, needs expert advice and lots of care, but um, it's, that's the kind of thing where if you've got the scaffold up, and you've got enough time to plan ahead for these things. The, the, the repair isn't urgent, but you can plan in additional measures. You can look at things like um, insulating externally, um, but the, you know, it's a very significant task. Um, uh, but yeah, do think about the building comprehensively. I think that was your original question there, sorry. No, thanks, Chris. Um, and there was actually, there's quite a bit, a lot of, of good stuff in there. And we're looking forward to, to doing some events with you uh, coming up in March, actually, in Glasgow. Um, and one thing you did touch on was sort of connecting up um, suppliers um, and uh, and owner occupiers. And I assume this is also, it's not just owner occupiers, but landlords. There's no reason why landlords can't take part oh, yeah. as well, right? Yeah, landlords, you know, building professionals, you know, the progressive professionals, who, you know, landlords who want to future-proof their homes uh, in terms of legislation for minimum energy efficiency standards and eventually for low carbon heating requirements with with um with uh which you know might come in the, in the 2030s um as a requirement so yeah landlords very welcome to, to get involved um, and you were talking about how one of the the roles of that you'll be building up is the connecting up um contractor suppliers with um people in those buildings and we've got a question actually on this topic uh that i'll try to to both of you, John, this might be something a little bit more for you, but but Chris, please pop in. Fiona's having a little trouble uh, connecting up, actually, so we're just going to crack on here with the with just the three of us. Hopefully, Fiona can join us in a, a bit later, but I'm glad we were able to get a, a good long interview um, with her partaking, um, sort of giving us her knowledge on the subject. But we have a question from uh, Sarah. It's uh, any advice on a company who can supply casement windows with high level seals, hermetic seals? We have serious driven rain ingress issues. It's a listed warehouse in Leith uh, and several companies have tried, but always with a single seal. So um, 
we're under one roof doesn't uh, generally give out um, uh, recommendations for companies in particular. However, um, a combination of if there's nobody else doing it, um, and so there's only one, one or two companies doing it, or uh, the opportunity of where would be a good place to go find that. John, you might have some ideas about where Sarah could uh, go and have a look to see where she might find a company that does that. I, I was hoping you'd ask Chris because the answer is no, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm aware of some companies that do fashion case windows and things like this, but in respect of yeah, my, my knowledge is very limited in that respect. I, I only know of them rather than um, anything else. So I don't know about the details and the depth of details. So sorry, I can't help. No, that's fine. Um, and if there's any, we've got about 30 people that are joining us today. Some of them are professionals uh, in the sector as well. So please pop in any suggestions or, um, that you might have into the to the chat room. Um, in the meantime, Sarah, what uh, what I would recommend you do is just drop us an email and to anyone uh, at info at under one roof dot Scott um, with your question. And we have your contact details. I will go away and, and we'll certainly um, do some inquiries and see what we can get back to you as far as some information on those lines. So um, one other question that's come in, um, another question that's come in from Gemma. Uh, so I'd like to ask about how the stonework is breathable and how we can help damp rooms to dry out. Uh, for example, are there any links or suggested places to go look for that? Uh, so how to how we can help damp rooms to dry out um, when the walls are made of sandstone? What kind of time would you be thinking and what might be the optimal indoor temperature for this? These are crappy uh, questions. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, there's the, the obvious one about ventilation and opening the window. I mean, that's just, I mean, I know it's basic stuff and you have dehumidifiers and things. But what what actually can happen is it's it depends on on the type of paint you can use can actually uh, stop the can stop moisture uh, coming out your property, can trap the moisture in a, a traditional building and then also wallpapers and things like that. So you really, when you get into that detail, you really need to get somebody who is, I would just suggest, a building surveyor who can actually give you guidance in respect of how to dry out your room. Because each building, whilst the traditional buildings are all, all built with similar materials and built in a similar way, each building and has got its own, has well, is different. So on that basis, um, and you know, the, the, the again, a lot of unintended consequences where people have done, have decorated their homes and done things for the, the right reasons, but then they might attract moisture where you, a building surveyor can actually say, well, you've used, you need to do this, you need to do that or something else to um, actually get the ventilation back into the house uh, as it's meant to operate. So um, whilst making sure it's still wind and watertight in respect of uh, leaks and things. So that, that would be my thing. We'd be get, get a, a building surveyor out to have a look at it and look at your property and give you that guidance on, on the issues that you've got. I, I'd add one thing here, which is like, you know, the, the time scales for these, you know, for, for on which walls, solid walls get wet and dry out is on the scale of a year. So in a normal, healthy building, the wall will get wetter in the winter and will dry out in the summer. It will dry out inward in, towards the living space in the winter and it will dry outward when it's dry outside, dried and warmer outside. So it's a, a normal building has a yearly cycle of getting um a wall has a yearly cycle of getting wet and, and drying. And if it's, I've seen deeply monitored, like heavily monitored retrofits for traditional buildings where it's taken two years for a previously wet wall to dry out, and even longer in, in some cases. So it's very long time scales. And the, what, the thing to think about, if it's a really bad um, leak, then do get ex expert advice. If it's not so bad, then the thing to be thinking about more than temperature is relative humidity. So what's, get, get a humidity sensor and just keep an eye on how humid it is in the property. You want to be avoiding relative humidity levels above 60 or 70 percent. Um, that's a suggestion, it's not advice, it really depends on the building. Yeah. No, that's a good point, Chris, but also, you know, the, the modern thing of everyone drying their, you know, especially in the winter in Scotland, drying their clothes on the radiators is just a, an absolute moisture trap for the building. Uh, so, you know, and as I keep telling my wife, but she never listens. That's that's another issue um, in respect of our home uh, that, you know, you've got to be careful about that. There's people yeah. walking, people, we give out moisture. We can't exactly, by breathing, you can't stop that. 
but you can stop your uh, putting your, your, your washing on your radiators and uh, letting that moisture out into your building and getting trapped in your building and That's creating it. the issue worse. So yeah, cross ventilation, open the windows at the front of the building and at the back of the building, get a bit of a draft coming through the building um, at least you know once or twice a day for, for half an hour or something. That will keep your humidity levels un under control at the very least. If you don't, and better than that would be some mechanical ventilation, some continuous mechanical ventilation. But uh, yeah, okay. And do we have any idea on um, how long it takes after a roof leak? Uh, how long does it take for those wooden beams to dry out? Is it? I couldn't say with any confidence. I'm sorry. It really depends on the situation. I think that's definitely one to get some expert advice on. Yeah, and that's and that is something. Um, what we can do is, um, and S uh, Suzanne had asked that question. What we can do is, I think, um, if you want to drop us an email, what we can do is, I can consult. Uh, we can have a have a think and um, find some uh, people, to particularly working in that area, um, and uh, see if we can get you some um, a bit of a guide to that. Um, do we? Uh, it, what assistance is there available um, for? preservation and echo measures for associations and, and homeowners what is the um, what is the level of funding out there both at a at a government level nonprofit and um, and council level well um for, for energy efficiency improvements um so if you are um would be classified as fuel poor then the eco scheme so the energy company obligation schemes so paid for by the energy suppliers out, out of everybody's bills is the place to go and that scheme's changing so from this later this year it, previously it was companies trying to sell you a, a new get you to take a new boiler or a bit of loft insulation or a bit of floor insulation now it's gonna be very different later this year it's gonna be a whole building approach so much fewer projects but d deeper and bigger projects um so eco if you're would be on if you're on some kind of benefits or, or or in some way vulnerable for health reasons or something and if you're if you don't qualify for that then you can go to home energy scotland and they can tell you about the funding that's available from the Scottish government, which is on a measures basis, which doesn't include advice, unfortunately, but it does include support for, and doesn't include anything for ventilation, which I think is a miss, but um, it does include support for uh, heat pumps or insulation, including loans and sometimes some cash back. Um, so that's, those are the two places to go um, for homeowners anyway. If you're in a, if you're if, if you're in social rent, then obviously the, the social the your social landlord should be taking care of these things. Yeah, speak to them. Yeah. And as far as sort of preservation funding, are we do uh, does anybody have off the top of their head any sort of suggestions on where you can find oh. some for that? Well, if you, if you live in uh in well, the, the the there are several conservation area regeneration schemes, and if you live within the parameters of these. Uh, these schemes, then they, uh, there's quite often funding, uh, grant funding to assist with the repair and maintenance of your building or repair of your building. Uh, equally, there are city heritage trusts, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Perth, except Stirling, um, Aberdeen, and Dundee, and others uh, still in Burness, which um, they can help with some funding towards uh, your repairs, be it in a loan or be it a grant, but you'd have to approach the individual um, City Heritage Trust to determine if, if you li lie within the param their, their geographical parameters which they can uh, give grants and what their grant funding is. And. Uh... Diane, and I would recommend actually everyone, if in the chat room, you can see there's some conversations going on and people suggesting some ideas. We've got Diane has written and said that if you live in a, in a uh, cars area, you can contact the local officer who may be able to give you advice on small repair grants via Home Energy Scotland. So you could, there's another recommendation there. Um, and uh, so, uh, so keep those coming and keep those recommendations coming. Um, for uh, information so we can uh, have this interactive element of this, I think is extremely helpful. Uh, so that was a question from Susan. Susan, hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, now, Sophia's got a question about renovating a flat and where the best place is to put radiators, either out, outer walls or interior uh, internal walls. Now, I would assume this would be the kind of the situation where you really need to sort of speak to an expert on that because um, it's, uh, it's very dependent on the situation on the rooms. Is that right, John? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to give you guidance on that. But what I would say is, is 
to take a, a holistic view of the property. So, um, so taking the, the approach of getting the, the right qualified person and talking about the heat movement, the moisture movement, and everything of the building rather than just where shall I put my radiators. It's, it is all about that, the movement of air and within the building. So get make sure it's somebody who is able to give that advice for your building as opposed to just say, well, I always put them there under the windows. Why? Uh, somebody will tell you actually this is the best place to put for your building. I recently had an air source heat pump uh, put, uh, put into my building and they moved some radiators for that reason. I have no idea why they moved them, but they said for an air source heat pump, the heat's different because it's a lower heat. You can't boost it up as quickly like you can with a gas boiler. And they said this is where we'd put the radiators for your air source heat pump. And I just accepted their advice because they were the experts in that. Is there a central place to find um or as far as what's, what's the best way, I guess, to to find uh, quality contractors that work with traditional building methods? Or is it really just a matter of having to do Google searches and do your own research? Well, I, I would put a pitch in for the trade associations, which pay me. So uh, but you'd expect <laughs> that. hopefully you'd expect that. So as you see over my corner, NFRC and Stone Federation. Um, yeah, I think the, the challenge there is is make sure you get the right and there's lots of good contractors who aren't members of the trade association. So uh, it's the, the challenge is there are some and, and trade associations don't help ourselves in this respect because some trade associations are hard to get in than others and have a, a more rigorous vetting procedure. And obviously, I would say that because the ones I represent do have that. But um, it's very hard for members of the public to differentiate between one trade association and the other. Um, but getting one that specializes on electrical select let's say uh, that that's what they do is is the special the, the, or, or snippet for your your plumbing etc like that um they, they specialize in that area so you, you want to get um a trade association that specializes in and the people in that that area of construction and the people that they're vetting them are qualified to vet them and uh, approve them for their um to undertake that work or to get that uh, trade association uh, accreditation. Um, so, yeah, it, it's very hard for homeowners in that respect. Uh, but th there are a number of trade associations out there which go through the, which have which are sp specific for electrical plumbers or the ones I represent, and they would be able to uh, identify contractors which have been vetted by the in the, the industry uh, for that specific roofing classification. Because for roofing, we've got about well, we have a roofing awards. I think there's 13 awards. There's 13 different types of roofing. Uh, and when we uh, when we approve a, con a contractor for it, they only get approved for the ones that they can demonstrate competence in. Um, so in, in that respect, um, it's very hard for homeowners in that respect but to just, just find trade associations, I would say, that specialise in their in one type of uh, building rather than generic uh, construction uh, trade associations. And I've put a link into the chat room um, on a under one roof has some resources um, uh, as well on this topic that I'd encourage you all to take a look at. Um, I put one link in about uh, uh, the different associations, but there's also uh, Jazz can throw a link in there about finding a trades firm. And we've got um, uh, some suggestions on how to go about um, with that process of narrowing down um, what it is you're looking for and how to seek out the best quality. And sometimes it's just a matter of word of mouth. It's just a matter of seeing other building work that's going on if you're in a conservation area um, and seeking out uh, somebody in that building and finding out who's doing that and if they're happy with the work. Um, as simple as that, um, that can go a long way to, to helping you um, find somebody, some quality work. Um, a few more minutes here. So we've got a, and we've got a, a few other sort of questions. This is um, uh, it was a question about windows that uh, John, you were going to dive into a bit earlier and I um, but we, I said we had gotten some suggested um, questions around that. Um, co-owners are thinking of putting in uh, PVC windows, but I'm worried this will reduce the value of the whole building uh, as this may affect the full building because it count as an improvement and therefore uh, require a, a vote. Uh, second question on that is, can I remove my PVC windows and replace them with traditional sash and case windows? And what does the effect have on that? John, you were going to talk a little bit about PVC windows. So maybe you could address the, uh, a little bit of that in there. And I, I can jump in, and Chris as well. 
Yeah, I, I don't know the exact details of, of of value of your home and things like that. I, you know, it, I, it depends. You know, what is the value of anybody's home? But my point about the that I was going to touch on about Sasha Case Windows, Historic Environment Scotland do a very good informed guide on this, uh, so that's something to look at. But yeah, I can understand the 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 desire and, and the, the the promotion of uh, um, UPVC windows. But Fiona touches on the fact that. You know, it's not a recyclable product. We're looking at uh, landfill waste when they do when they do finish. Whilst our sash and case window is timber and can be reused and fixed and reused and things like that. But um, there are alternative methods to getting uh, good um, U values or, or, or reducing the heat emissions from your your windows rather than a UPVC window. And um, you can look at secondary glazing. I was in a building in Cooper, which they had, uh, it was a traditional building, it was done by the Fife Historic Building Trust, and they put secondary glazing in, and it was fantastic. You couldn't, you would never notice this from the outside of the building. They'd put it in throughout the, the building, and uh, and they still had access, so they could still open the windows should they wish to. It wasn't the way it had been done, so you could still get that ventilation that you were talking about, Chris, if somebody wished to open the windows. Um, the other one, which uh, is, is shutters, uh, traditional buildings, a lot of them have shutters, and rather, and a lot of them have been painted in and cannot be moved. But actually, if you can, I've actually got a friend who's doing this in Vigor, um, and uh, he's renovating his traditional building. And get your shutters uh, fixed, and so you can close your shutters in the evening, and that stops your your heat emissions. The other another option is also the uh, within this, within a sash and case window, you can actually put a double glazed unit in, and then because of the way that the weightings are done. Which will be on demonstration at the Edinburgh Traditional Building Festival. See, I got my plug in again. Um, and uh, but you can then alter the weightings on the, or the lead weightings on the in the in the casing, and therefore uh, you can because you've been increasing the weight of the window, and so you can put double glazing within your sash and case window. And the most obvious one, which uh, I'm sure so many people do, heavy curtains. So a combination of all these three or, or two or three of these uh, can give you fantastic results in respect of redu reduce, reducing the heat loss through your windows. Um, so don't just think double glazing or this or not double glazing. There's a number of options within that. Uh, on, on a personal note, um, if you've got sash and case windows, I think they look gorgeous and I would never understand somebody replacing them but that's that's just a, a personal opinion because uh, <laughs> on, on aesthetics much like Fiona was saying you know the whole aesthetics of a building outside what's it they say on these programs I don't watch them but it's a curb appeal or something like that uh, for me you look at a building you see the lovely sandstone you see the the slate on the roof and you see sash and case windows and a timber door and you go that's a cracking building from my perspective so um that's just in respect of value of housing, I'm not the one to speak to on that, though. And just to finish up, Chris, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, just one thing is, which is, um, yeah, I think it's important to balance the preservation of conserving heritage against conserving energy and carbon. But um, we, the, the other thing to add is that air tightness, so air infiltration, so accidental ventilation through gaps around the windows, uh, missing seals or damaged seals, ventilation is a really, really a huge part of heat loss in buildings, maybe a third of the heat loss in, in many buildings. So you can do an awful lot with what John said about shutters, curtains, secondary glazing, and there are affordable forms of secondary glazing, you know, low, lower, less expensive. And if you combine that with it, with the air tightness, make sure that the seals around the sash and case are in really good condition. And just look, hunt out any last little nook and cranny that's letting in some air, seal it, but balance that with it, make, make sure you're monitoring um, maintaining good air quality with periodic uh, deliberate ventilation and uh, that will massively uh, address your your energy efficiency john chris yeah. thanks very much for uh, for joining us today uh now i think it's been a, a fascinating conversation and uh fiona unfortunately couldn't be here to, uh, due to some tech issues but we got i wanted to thank her for taking the time out to um, do uh, a long and detailed uh, interview with me on, on many of the topics that uh, we dived into in a little bit more detail today. Um, we're going to be having our um, monthly Q&A um, webinar in a couple of weeks time. Uh, it'll be a Tuesday 
uh, at noon uh, in two weeks from today. And so we'd encourage you to, to, to come along to that. Um, we got to, uh, I think, all the questions pretty much today, though, uh, for those that we couldn't answer, again, drop us an email at info at under one roof dot scott and we will get you um we will go searching out and find the information that we couldn't provide today and get that over to you um as quick as we can um and um yeah so i just wanted to thank everybody we'll we'll be having uh continuing our webinar series coming up in the next uh few months but uh until then uh john and chris uh thanks for joining us today thank you thank you all right all right and we'll see you all in a couple of weeks time bye now bye cheers